Very good morning to you. Last time I discussed the uncorrected vector cardiographic lead systems. That was uh, quite much uh, history and actually quite much entertainment because they do not have a real clinical role. But uh, it's good to know where the things started. I a little bit last time discussed about the Frank lead system, but I will start from the Frank lead. So I will today tell you the corrected vector cardiographic lead systems. Uh, Frank, McPhee, Barungao, Sweck, 3 and Nelson lead system. Of course, the purpose of this lecture is to describe how they are constructed and how do they work and what are the benefits and drawbacks of them. But I would say that the most important uh, things in this lecture is to teach you how to use these different methods of bioelectromagnetism uh, for designing new lead systems. And as examples, I use just the design of these vector cardiographic lead systems. So this lecture should primarily increase your understanding on the behavior of the leads in various kinds of uh, volume conductors and how to manipulate them, how to develop those and so on. So that is the main purpose. So I will start with Frank lead system. Uh, F F Ernest Frank was a clinical cardiologist, but he was very much technically oriented. And the lead system which he designed, despite of this uh, uh, shortcomings, shortcomings, of course, nothing is perfect. Despite of those facts, it is clinically uh, the most reliable system. And uh, during the 50s, there were used all those uh, lead systems which were on the previous slide. But then during the time, the Frank lead system got the dominating role. And at the moment, there is no other vector cardiographic lead system in practice used in clinical science, in clinical work than the Frank lead system. So the role of the vector cardiographic lead system is that uh, uh, it is the 12 lead ECG, which is the primary lead system, which is used in clinical electrocardiology. And vector cardiography is used uh, quite much. And actually, uh, the computerized ECG systems, they record both of those, all that data which is available, and make the diagnosis on that basis. So the Frank lead system is the basic fundamental clinical vector cardiographic lead system. What are the preconditions? Frank used uh, as a source, point dipole in the fixed location, and the conductor model, the thorax model, was finite and homogeneous. So it had the uh, outer surface of the male thorax, but it did not include any internal inhomogeneities. And the theoretical method which he used and applied in designing this system was the image surface method. Just about the inhomogeneities, this is just a, a model which we had in Tampere for magnetocardiography lead developments. Uh, so I just show that this how it looks like when it is a homogeneous model, a plastic model of the thorax uh, with no inhomogeneities. And here on the left, you see the inhomogeneities which were added inside this homogeneous model. Uh, the model was, of course, filled by saline. And uh, in the inhomogeneities, the spine was uh, fully insulated uh, plastic model. And the lungs were made from uh, foam plastic. But as I said, 
uh, Frank did not have any internal inhomogeneities in his model. This is a sketch of Frank's model, which you saw already earlier in the connection of, of the image surface discussion. And I just repeat that it has a form of the male thorax, as you may see. Uh, it has the coordinate system uh, where is defined 12 coordinate levels, uh, where the heart is on the level 6, and the distance between the levels is 5 centimeters and actually 2 inches, because he was an American, he made it in the United States. Uh, in transverse plane, you see the coordinates so that uh, it was uh, uh, placed here uh, lines in 22.5 degrees angle, uh, which went through the uh, geometrical center of the model. And uh, those points where these lines intersected the surface on each level were labeled with letters from A to P. And the heart model was located one inch to the left on the sagittal plane and four, four centimeters to the front from the uh, uh, frontal plane. This indicates how the heart looks like, but there were nothing in that size. This is just an indication in the, to show how the heart would look like. There were actually only three uh, dimensional sores here in the center. And the technical issue was that uh, uh, he constructed the model physically double the size and he used it upside down so that it was easier to handle the dipole in the heart location from this opening rather than from the neck. Then using that model he uh, measured the image surface. It is shown here in the frontal plane. So I ask again, I have asked it several times, but I ask again, how did he get this image surface? What has to be done to get the image surface of the model? Can anyone tell me? I told quite many times, so you may be tired to that explanation, but I still once tell it. He placed consecutively a unit dipole, first in x direction, then in y direction, and then in z direction to the location in the model where the center of the heart is. He activated the dipoles one at a time, consecutively, one at a time, and measured the potentials on each level from those recording points from A to P. That potential which he measured is the coordinate of the corresponding point in uh, image space, the coordinate for the X axis, the x-coordinate. Then he placed a unit dipole in direction of y, measured all the potentials from all the points, and that measurement results were the location of that point in image surface for its y-coordinate, and the same for z-coordinate. So, here are shown these lead vectors, what he obtained, were the lead vectors uh, for uh, these measurement points, and that's how they look like in the level 6. That's how they look like on level 5. Do I have that? No, I don't have to level 4. So, these are the points of the image surface on the certain coordinate points, and the image surface the total image surface is, of course, obtained by joining those points uh, smoothly in the space.
Frank was a clinical cardiologist and understood well the practical clinical problem. So he had the following criteria for designing the lead system. Firstly, it should be easy to apply. Uh, uh, time is money in hospitals also, and it should be fast and easy to the techni laboratory technician to do the easy vector cardiographic recording, to place the electrodes easily and to place them correctly to certain desired points so that they are accurately on, on the, on the uh, correct points to provide the reproducibility of the lead system. That is important. When patient is, has some heart problem, is taken to the hospital, it is compared, of course it is the standards alone, the ECG what is recorded, but it is also compared to the ECG which is recorded from the same patient earlier and possibly in another hospital. So it must be reproducible, uh, this recording. And he was smart to understand the left hand problem, which is an important problem in recording electrocardiograms with vector cardiographic system or equally well with uh, 12 lead ECG. And it is surprising how little this left hand problem is understood and known uh, in practical clinical electrocardiography. It is it's important problem. It is a very big issue, but it is not recognized. And I repeat, I last time I told it, but I repeat it again, what is the left hand problem? If you think that it is recorded the Eindhoven lead one from the patient, that means that the signal between the two hands, the lead field for the Eindhoven lead one looks something like this. But if the patient, when lying on the table for recording a uh, situation, places his left hand on the side of the body, the skin is wet from the sweat, so it is conducting through, then actually the lead field looks like this. And that is not anymore the lead one, that is lead two. So that is very important that uh, when recording the ECG, whether it is 12 lead ECG or vector cardiography or whichever, when the patient is uh, lying on the uh, table, uh, the patient should not keep hands on the side, uh, either one or both hands on the sides, must have the hands so that they do not touch the sides of the body. That's, that's important. But anyhow, even though this is said that it should be done so that the hands don't touch, they often do touch on the side, which uh, destroys or, or increases distortion in the signal. And Frank was smart enough to understand this issue and he designed a system which is immune for the left hand problem. Let's start to construct, uh, uh, let's uh, step to the boots of Frank and start to construct the uh, lead system using the image surface information which he recorded and which I did show in the frontal plane. So how to proceed? Let's start with the Y component. This is very basic information, everyone knows that, but this is the beginning how to start it. To detect the Y component of the source, the lead vector shall be in the direction of Y axis. Because if the lead vector is in the direction of Y axis, then that lead detects the Y component and only the Y component. And for practical reasons, the lead vector should be as long as possible, which means that the measurement sensitivity is uh, as good as possible and the signal what is obtained is as uh, a large amplitude as possible. How do we start? Let's have a look to the uh, image surface, just the same image surface which I did show you uh, a few slides before in frontal plane. 
Now this is the same issue, the same plane shown in transverse plane in the other projection. How do we find lead vector which uh, fills the needs in the previous slide? Firstly, it has to be in the direction of y-axis and secondly, it has to be as long as possible. So we find that the lead vector, which is the lead, is uh, recorded between on level 6, y-axis is pointing uh, to that direction, recorded between the uh, electrode points H and B, fills very well these two requirements. It is long, the lead vector, and it is in the direction of y-axis. So if we do the recording of the uh, y a component from those points which are in real space in the patient here, this is on the level 6, point B and point H, then we get the strongest possible signal when rec and we record the Y component and only the Y component. So this fills the previous slide needs. But Frank, as I said, had more requirements. He understood that finding those points is rather easy, but they are they may change from from uh, uh, session to session. So they are somewhere here. He wanted to use points which are uh, more easily found and reproducible from the hospital to hospital and so on. So instead of points H and B, he selected the points A and I, which are easy to find. How does the lead vector between these recording points look like? Where are the points A and I in the image space on the level 6? They are here, I and A. <coughs> the lead vector is rather long, uh, satisfactory long, but it is not quite in the direction of y-axis. So we have to make some correction. Now comes just the benefits of the image surface uh, method and theory. This is just which you must uh, switch your brain uh, to understand that uh, with this kind of geometrical uh, analysis or geometrical development of the lead vectors, you uh, change the properties of the recording uh, uh, lead. So what we do, we make some correction to here. I will, okay, the correct lead vector which would start from the recording point I should go to that direction and actually it is possible to find that point if we draw a line from A to C. Frank took into use the point C which is easier to find, it is between A and E, just in the middle here. And how do we find this point in the real space? Real, in re, real space. The procedure is the following. I draw in the next slide this only this uh, uh, level six outer surface of the image surface, and it is uh, shown here. Here is an image space. The level six. It is much smaller now, but you see that it is the same. So how to find, if we take the recording points A prime and C prime in image space, to draw a line here, how do we find the lower case A prime point in real space? It is found so that we make the recording, we place the electrodes to A and C here, Join them with two resistors so that the 
magnitude, the value of the resistors, actually the ratio is the same as the ratio of these lengths. Capital A prime to lowercase a prime and lowercase a prime to capital C prime. So just geometrical lengths of these two parts of the line. The ratio of these lengths is 1.28 to 4.59. Then this point electrically is this point in image space. That's what we wanted. So important for this point A is that the ratio of these resistances is that as it is here, but how he got just exactly these numbers. He was a smart guy. He was very smart electrically. He understood that uh, the patient has to be in the lead system electrically balanced to cancel or minimize the common mode noise which comes for instance from the from the lamps and from the lines and so on so he has he connected to this electrode i a resistor of value r and now 1.28 and 4.59 their parallel resistance, if you just make the calculation, parallel resistance of these two resistors is 1, 1 R. So the impedance from both of these lines to the, to the uh, body is 1 R. That is a very smart point. What is the value of the R? That's of secondary importance. It is in practice, it is something between 25 and 100 kilo ohms. It, it, can, it may be selective, any, any value. It was smaller in earlier times and now when having high impedance uh, input amplifiers it may be higher. So I repeat, because this is the key point. Everything what follows from here uh, just repeats this principle. So I repeat here. He didn't select the lead vector between these two points even though it had been just uh, electrically ideal because the recording points were not ideal in the body. He selected the recording points I and A which are ideal. But the lead vector between I and A is not quite in the direction of y-axis. It has to be corrected. He took in use the lead, the recording point C and now it is possible to draw a line between A prime and C prime and find a lowercase a prime point here so that this lead vector is in the direction of y axis. And this lowercase a prime point in, sorry, I just pressed the button, to find this point in the real space is found so that we just take a ruler and measure how long is this part of the line that's uh, line and how long geometrically is this line and find the ratio of these lengths the ratio of these lengths is the same as the ratio of these two resistors we place here two resistors and the ratio of these resistances of these resistors is the same as the ratio of this geometrical length. So it is surprising that geometrical length in millimeters or whichever inches or whichever units corresponds to resistances in the real space. So uh, there is infinite number of possibilities to make, make resistances, two resistances, which have the same ratio as this here. But he selected these resistances, therefore, that the parallel resistance of these two resistors is 1 and placing here 1 R resistance, the patient is in balance. That's the point. This is all what you need to know in uh, image surface method using in designing lead systems. I will show you 
uh, the two, how do Frank designed the two other components, but the procedure is exactly the same. So let's, uh, okay, I point out here, I will tell this again, the reproducibility is obtained in the way that it is not used uh, uh, H and B electrodes, it is used I and A and C, and the left hand problem is avoided so that it is not used the arms as electrode location, only locations in the thorax. Then the left arm uh, problem is eliminated. These are the two points. I'm happy I didn't skip those because they are important ones. I should make them text larger. Now I go to the C component. Procedure is exactly the same. Here is shown how the, well, this is, it is not necessary for this purpose, but it is shown how the Frank triangle looks like in the uh, image space. But anyhow, he selected as recording points uh, primarily the neck and the left leg, which is down here. Let's take this uh, projection separately. It is shown here of the image uh, surface. Neck is on the level one, electrode H, and uh, left foot is somewhere in the middle of the lowest level 12. Lead vector between these two recording points is not accurately in the direction of Z axis. So he corrected that. He used the electrode M on the level 6. If we draw a line between M and F, then we can find the point K prime and the line, the lead vector from K prime to H is in direction of Z axis. How do we find the point K prime in real space? We take a ruler and measure geometrically how long is this line and how long is that line. We place resistors, two resistors here and the ratio of these resistances is the same as the ratio of the length of these two parts of the line. And the value is selected so, the ratio is kept the same, value is selected so that the parallel resistance of these two resistances of this lead is one and we have the balancing resistance here. The exactly the same procedure as in the Y component. And then I take the X component. Uh, it is more complicated. Let's go to the, here is again in the uh, transverse plane, the level six. A recording of the X component, the, the lead, uh, uh, designing of the leader for the X component, Frank made much more complicated. The principle how to do it is the same, but it is much more complicated. If I had asked to make the design, I have used as one electrode M, drawn a line here between E and C, and used that as the other end of the lead vector. But he wanted to make it more complicated. Why? I don't know. I don't have information on that. Uh, I guess the information is, the reason is that when using more electrodes from the available electrodes for uh, constructing the lead vector, some contact problem in one electrode uh, makes smaller error 
if the number of electrodes is larger. That may be the uh, real reason. But if that is the real reason, why didn't he use that principle in, in the Y and Z leads? There may be another reason, which is that uh, uh, he wanted to, to joke. He wanted to make it a little bit more complicated, just to demonstrate his competence and, and make the, the, the users of the system embarrassed. I don't know what is, the, what is the case, but anyhow, that's what he made. And finally, uh, here are, that point is found by placing resistors to M and A, and that point is found by placing resistors to I, E, and C. And calculation of the, uh, ratio, the ratios come from the geometry, and the numerical values so that the parallel resistance is one, and it is also here it is one. Anyhow, that's how he made it, that's it. This is all the resistors in the three previous slides. The recording points uh, IACA, IECAMFH, and the resistances from the previous slides are collected here, and the uh, uh, lead or, or the recording points for, for uh, Y, X and Z leads are just here, just directly from the previous slides. Now, let's again take the ruler and take the three previous slides and measure how long the lead vectors are in each uh, lead. And we find, with whichever is our calibration, these are relative numbers, we find that the Y lead vector is 174 units, X lead vector is 156 units and Z lead vector is 136 units. So, you find that this lead system is orthogonal because the lead vectors were really in X, Y and Z direction, but it is not normalized. You find that the sensitivities, the lengths of the lead vectors are different in these three uh, leads. So, it has to be normalized to get an orthonormal lead system. And it is normalized so that it is placed here, these resistors which uh, attenuate the signal in proper amount. Now we have an orthonormal lead system, what we wanted. And this is how we can also draw the resistor network. So the resistor network shown here is in the frank vector cardiographic recorder inside the device and there is coming leads recording electrodes to the neck, to the foot and on level 6 to A, C, E, I and M. And that's it. This is the frank lead system and this is the lead system which is in hospitals, in clinical practice for vector cardiography. The other lead system, which I'm happy to tell you, are not anymore used, but I want to tell you them because they use different theoretical methods. Then I tell that the Frank vector cardiographic lead system is orthonormal provided that, and then comes four issues, so you may anticipate that perhaps it is not necessarily orthonormal because perhaps those four issues are not true. What are they? When? What has to be real so that Frank lead system is orthonormal? So apparently you may anticipate that it is perhaps not orthonormal. Let's go to the preconditions. I gave the preconditions, which are the source is point dipole and conductor is finite homogeneous. Now I ask you, is the heart of the patient a point dipole? No, it is not. Is the body, the thorax of the patient homogeneous? No, it is not. Does the Frank model thorax model 
have the same form as the patient thorax has? Sometimes perhaps, but not usually. So, if the heart is a point dipole, but it is not, it is a volume source. If it is located in the correct location, that most often happens. If the thorax is homogeneous, which is not, absolutely not. If it has the form of the model, sometimes it may have actually, I don't know whose thorax Frank used exactly when designing the model, but some patient may really have that kind of uh, uh, thorax, but uh, not all of them. So, what I show you here is that apparently, in most of the cases, this great lead system of Frank is not orthonormal. It is not. So, what does it do for the clinical diagnosis? Firstly, why did Frank give the resistance values with four numbers, with three decimals, if the accuracy is lost anyhow? Why it is given with so high accuracy? There is a good reason for that. If it is given with four numbers, the manufacturers of the vector cardiographic lead uh, uh, recorders think that, aha, uh -huh, it is really accurately designed. They must have these accurate values, and that's what we do, which ensures that all the recording devices are similar. Whichever is the value, it is the same in all the devices. And actually what I claim it is that it doesn't matter what the value is because it is always wrong, but it's important that it is same in all recording devices to ensure the reproducibility. Well, if it is so uh, wrong, what is the clinical value of such a recording system which is, which is not orthonormal? This is an important uh, theoretical issue which you have to understand. It doesn't matter whether the three uh, lead vectors are orthogonal and or orthonormal. It is sufficient that there's somewhere close to that. It doesn't matter if they are just accurate because there does not exist any absolute ECG or vector cardiographic signal. The signal what is recorded from, from the patients is what it is. It is recorded from healthy people, this and this and this kind of signal. And from sick people having certain cardiac sicknesses is recorded that and that kind of signal, which is compared to the healthy uh, person's signals. Important is only that they are recorded in the same way. It doesn't matter whether, whether it is correct or wrong lead system. Important is that it is always recorded with the same way from all patients. So small uh, deflections from the orthonormality. Absolutely no meaning. Absolutely no meaning. If it is very much changing, then it, it has to change the uh, deviate very much from the orthogonality for certain reasons. I, I don't go to the details, then it might have some minor effect. But anyhow, this is the point. So please don't worry, even though it is not really orthonormal, important that it is reproducible, easy to apply, no left hand problem, and close to orthonormal. That's important. I go to the next lead system, which is McPhee Parungal. Richard McPhee was the fellow who introduced the lead field theory. So it is apparent that he wanted to design a lead system which applies the lead field theory. That's clear, of course. What is characteristic for the lead field theory? I told you before that in the image surface theory, 
the source is a point dipole. And I told you that in the lead field theory, it is possible to use a volume source, which is good, which is good thing. So, in mcphee parungao lead system, it's natural that in preconditions the source is a dipole moment of a volume source. So that's the way, the philosophy of way of thinking. For conductor, they selected, uh, like Frank, the finite homogeneous, but actually the way of thinking of the form of the thorax was much more primitive than Frank's way of thinking. I show you. Uh, this was designed uh, some six, seven years later, was it so, than, than Frank's system. And this was called also axial lead system. Why? Doesn't matter whichever. The, the basic idea behind uh, the way of thinking of McPhee was this. If we place two electrodes for recording the X component, one on the front side of the thorax, another one here, the lead field goes something like this. So you find that the lead field is in the heart region, is in the direction of X axis, only on the line joining these, and in other parts it, is, it has a very different direction. That is what holds for the Frank lead system, but as I said, don't worry about that. But they just wanted to uh, discuss this issue and, and see how to make the lead field linear and homogeneous in the heart region. I told that you before, this is the solution. They placed, this is a compromise always, they placed the three electrodes on the frontal anterior surface of the thorax in front of the heart and resistors here to divide the lead current. And now you see that the lead field quality in the region of heart is much better than with only one electrode. Then they also concluded that the back electrode is so far from the heart that it is sufficient to have only one electrode there. I agree with that. They place the electrodes at the edges of, of, of uh, equilateral triangle and they are located in this way. Uh, the coordinates are given here, I don't go to the details. And the back electrode is here. Then with the way, same way of thinking, they just thought that on the left side, which is quite close to the heart, but not as close as the anterior surface, it is sufficient to have only two electrodes. And on the right side, it is so far from the heart that, again, one electrode is sufficient. So they had these three electrodes on the anterior side with three times 100 kilo ohms resistors just to divide the, the lead current uh, uh, homogeneously. Two electrodes on the left side with these coordinates, 66 kilo ohms both of those. So the impedances for these electrodes were the same. And one electrode on the back and one electrode on the right side. Unfortunately, which I do not understand why, they forgot one thing. I appreciate McPhee. He's, he's a smart guy. Or, or was. I'm not sure whether he still lives. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I know him personally. He was an examiner in my doctoral examination, and I met him uh, before and later on uh, a few times. But uh, I'm not sure whether he still uh, lives. Anyhow, he's a smart guy. Despite of that, he forgot something. He forgot the balancing of the patient, which uh, uh, Frank uh, found. So to minimize the common mode noise, if the impedance of these three electrodes together, three times 100 kilo ohms, is 33 kilo ohms, there must be 33 kilo ohms resistance on the back electrode. 
Similarly, the uh, average impedance of this total impedance is 33 kilo ohms. There must be 33 kilo ohms resistance on the right side. These resistances were missing from the or original publication. I'm not sure whether he added those later on, but in the, from the original publication they are missing. And then it would be nice to have 33 kilo ohm resistances to these neck and left foot electrodes, even though the patient is in balance also without the electrodes, but when having these, then the impedance from all leads to the patient is the same. Anyhow, that's it. So designing theoretically McPhee Parunga lead system is simple. It is using the lead field approach, very logical, very easy. But what's the drawback here? You may guess that placing these electrodes on the chest is not easy. They had some Shablun uh, model uh, which was used for placing on the uh, frontal side of the thorax, but still it may just uh, change the location so that reproducibility is not the best one. And same on the left side here. So that was the problem with McPhee Parunga lead system. It was used quite much in the beginning, but then it disappeared. I go to the SWEC 3 lead system. Uh, the name comes from uh, stereo vector electrocardiography. Why they, Schmidt and Simonson, who designed it in 1955, why they had so uh, introduced so difficult name, stereo vector electrocardiography. What is a stereo in this case? I do not know. Three apparently means that this is a version three. The preconditions were that the, the dipole moment of the volume source is the source model and the conductor is finite inhomogeneous. In, my, in the printed version of my book, I, I write that it is homogeneous, but that's wrong. In the internet version, I s correct that it is inhomogeneous. Why? I uh, show you. They used lead vector method. They measured in the model large number of lead vectors. They have very long publications. I, I have never read it every, uh, every sentence through because it is very, very long story, very many illustrations and so on and so on. They measured many, many lead vectors and, and came to this conclusion which they came. So very, they made a lot of work. These are the guys, Otto Schmidt. Otto Schmidt, by the way, was a genius. He made several different uh, uh, contributions to science in general, not only uh, electrocardiography. For instance, if uh, some of you might know the Schmidt trigger, it's an electronic circuit uh, uh, which uh, generates a pulse. Uh, it is designed by Otto Schmidt, invented by Otto Schmidt. And he was in, in NASA in the US uh, 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 space project uh, uh, in, in a very high position in, in this organization, for instance. So he has made a lot of contributions. I do not know the career of Ernst Simonson in, in more detail, so I cannot tell anything about him. This is the plastic torso model used by Schmidt, quite similar as, uh, uh, as for uh, 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 as what uh, Frank had, but it was in, in normal orientation. It was not upside down like, like uh, Frank had, which, which is smart by Frank. And uh, its size is apparently uh, the normal uh, dimensions, normal size. Here is another model, which is a female model, which he designed according to the measures of, of his, his wife, Viola Smith. This is how the SWEC 3 lead system looks like. Finally, they came to this conclusion that uh, they have four recording points in the front, how they are geometrically uh, designed, uh, fixed, that's another issue. Apparently not so very easy to find the location, but that's how they are. Similarly, four locations, corresponding locations on the back. Then one electrode on the arm and connected to the resistors to another electrode on the side and the same on the, on the other side of the body.
and the neck and foot electrode. The resistances here are given. They are mostly 100 kilo ohm resistances to these uh, 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 frontal and uh, posterior electrodes as well, except this electrode to here is 70 kilo ohms. That's not a mistake in my, my illustration. It is 70 kilo ohms. We tested in Tampere with our inhomogeneous model, a computer model, what is the quality of SVEC 3 lead system when having this resistor 70 kilo ohms and when having this resistor 100 kilo ohms. And 70 kilo ohms gave slightly better results. So that is the reason why I say that it, they used really an inhomogeneous model, because if they had just had a homogeneous model, that had been 100 kilo ohms. There was in IEEE Engineering in Medicine and Biology journal a special issue of Otto Schmidt uh, telling all those very important contributions what he has made in very many different disciplines. I had the pleasure to uh, write an article of the SVEC 3 lead system to this journal. I was invited to do that. It was a great, great honor uh, and that is one of his contributions. And then the Nelson lead system. Clifford Nelson, who uh, uh, designed uh, the, the uh, Gabor Nelson uh, theorem, uh, of course, also wanted to uh, design a lead system which is based on Gabor Nelson theorem. That is natural. As a source, when you remember the Gabor Nelson theorem, they used a dipole moment of a volume source with a moving, actually, optimal location. So that comes from the Gabor Nelson theorem. It is a dipole moment of a volume source. So it is not a volume source, it is a dipole moment of the volume source. So it can be a point dipole as well, but in practice, the heart is a volume source only the dipole moment of that. And conductor is finite and homogeneous. You remember from the Gabor Nelson theorem that it must be finite to have the surface where we put place the surface, the uh, normal vectors, and it must be homogeneous to get the accurate result. This is how it looks like. They defined three levels, A, B, and C, from the body, having as uh, fixation points the suprasternal notch is here just uh, uh, the top part of, of, the, of the sternum, and then umbilicus, that is something which I don't like very much, because that is uh, the belly button, that is not uh, fixed to the, to the skeleton, it is on, on the stomach, so it is, uh, it is not so uh, accurate point, but anyhow, they uh, took that level, divided it to eight uh, parts and got these uh, recording levels A, B and C. And on each level, they just uh, had uh, eight recording points, just equally in angles, equally uh, uh, divided to eight uh, recording points. You remember this uh, uh, Nelson, Gabor Nelson equation? which for the dipole moment has conductivity outside the integral because it is constant. It has to be constant. Integral surface integral where it is multiplied the recorded voltage and the surface normal vector, which is here the surface normal vector. To find the orientation of the surface normal vector, it has to be measured this angle theta, and when the angle is measured, it is just placed here resistors so that R sub x over R is sinus theta. So they had three plus three electrodes on each level, 
and uh, with this uh, variable resistance uh, selected just on the basis of the angle theta. This is how the x component looks like, that's how the uh, y component looks like, very similar, and the z component is just again very simple, neck and foot electrodes. That's the whole story of Nelson lead system. It was not in clinical use practically, it has been used in theoretical studies. Here are some other, other studies, I, unfortunately I have very, very uh, bad quality illustration, I would like to have a good one. Fishman, Barber, Weiss, that is uh, rather a body surface mapping system. Patient is lying on the bed, you find that here in, on the bed there is uh, a large number of electrodes. And here are these kind of bars, if this perhaps uh, shows better bars, and this is system is just uh, descended uh, down to the, to the chest of the body and, and uh, these bars take the position on the surface of the body, they find the form of the body. Uh, okay, that's one, one uh, application, uh, that's another coordinate system. Here the same for the baby. The, that experimental system, not for clinical use at all. I discuss a little bit about, uh, compare the vector cardiographic lead system, which I told you these four. Here is a, a, a famous study that's done by Simos and colleagues quite a long time ago. They compared these three main vector cardiographic lead systems, SWEC3, Frank and McPhee, how immune the lead systems were for misplacement of electrodes. Here is shown the recorded uh, vector cardiography signal two angles, azimuth, elevation and the magnitude of the vector. And in each lead system it is recorded the with the electrodes in the original position and then in the two misplacement positions. Question is that how comparable these misplacement positions between three lead systems are. I would say that they are illustrative, not necessarily scientifically accurately comparable. So what they did, I don't necessarily need to go into the details how these, uh, these misplacements were made, but perhaps a short, uh, short introduction can be done. The original signals uh, in original positions are those. Then when placing in SVEC the V3 electrode two centimeters down or Frank system all electrodes two centimeters down or in McPhee, the distance between A and B, instead of 11 centimeters, it is 9 centimeters. Are these comparable misplacement? I, I, I don't want to discuss too much about that. Anyhow, the signals look these uh, uh, red lines in that way, and with an other kind of displacement, the blue line shown here. So what you see? You see that from these lead systems, the SWEC3 is quite immune for the misplacement of the electrodes. And that is easy to understand because there are many electrodes here. The lead field is homogeneous for a large region. Small displacement of the electrodes don't change the lead field too much. But in Frank, where the electrodes are just point electrodes here, if they are raised or lowered, that changes quite a lot the lead field and this signal is changed a lot. That's natural. McPhee has quite similarly as SVEC has three electrodes so small misplacement of the electrodes does not have so big effect. This is logical, logical to think in this way. I like this work, this is old work and that kind of works were made at those times quite many. This is one of those we do not need to go in details and see all those works, no. I think this is sufficient just to have an impression that it, it has a meaning or, or effect how accurately the electrodes are made, how reproducible the system is. Now I go to other leads, ECG lead systems. I discussed 12 lead systems 
and then I discussed uh, vector cardiographic lead systems, and now I go to other ECG lead systems. There are several other ones. I take some characteristic typical examples. What if we have as a source model the moving dipole? That can be used with the Gabor Nelson theorem. Well, there's not too many works done with this, uh, this model. Uh, uh, Martin Author and Gesell, which made some works, and then they found that when calculating the uh, location of the, of the moving cardiac dipole, for the great deal of the time, great proportion of the time of the QRS complex, it was located outside the anatomical uh, region of the heart. So that is impossible. Of course, it must be, source must be in the heart, not outside the heart. So it comes from the mathematical calculations and, and so on. So it is not uh, obvious solution. What about multiple dipole? Sylvester and, and some of his colleagues made a nice work by dividing the heart in regions and representing each of those regions with a dipole. And here is shown how the septum dipoles are activated in this model. Uh, left ventricle dipoles are activated and right ventricle dipoles in this way to generate the ECG. I come to this. What about multiple dipole? Multi sorry, I warned you that multiple dipole and multipole are, are so similar words that please don't mix them and please don't worry when I do mix them all the time. So I speak about multipole now. Uh, how to measure the multipole components of the cardiac source? Here is uh, used as a model a spherical homogeneous volume conductor model for the body. If that is our model, then the dipolar components X, Y, and Z are, of course, apparently recorded like this. And then the quadrupolar components are recorded in this way. That's how they mathematically come. It's not worth of spending time for recording octopolar and so on. You don't get any uh, real signal. They, when going further, the further away you go to the volume source, the faster, the higher order uh, terms decrease in amplitude. Quadrupolar components you get, but, but not more. I make a summary of the ECG lead systems. I skip this clinical diagnosis part. Uh, I make a summary of models used in various ECG systems. This is not uh, only of ECG, clinical ECG, but also of theoretical experiments. So this is a summary of models used in various ECG systems and research projects. This is the map which I like, like to show you quite often. Here is uh, shown number of source models, and here is shown number of conductor models. The Eindhoven lead system, just a basic lead system designed by uh, Willem Eindhoven, used only leads one, two, and three. He was working only in the frontal plane, so it was a two-dimensional problem. So as a source model, he used two-dimensional dipole. And his volume conductor model was trivial model, infinite spherical homogeneous, or uh, infinite or, sorry, infinite or spherical homogeneous model. The 12 lead ECG and vector cardiography, uncorrected vector cardiography, the cube, tetrahedron, and so on, they used as a source model a dipole with three components, and conductor was uh, trivial case, either infinite homogeneous or spherical homogeneous. They did not take into uh, the consideration the volume conductor properties at all, at all. Those vector cardiographic systems which used uh, homogeneous, finite homogeneous model were Frank McPhee and Gabor Nelson. 
they use finite model which has the outer surface of the volume conductor but no inhomogeneities inside the body. More accurate conductor model which was finite and inhomogeneous was used in the very old classical experiment of Burger and Van Milan and it was used also with the SWEC 3 vector cardiographic lead system. Then we can use uh, uh, as a source model a moving dipole, it has six uh, variables and in those studies made by Geber, Nelson and author, they used finite homogeneous volume conductor model. Multiple dipole works have been done. They have n variables. Sylvester was active in th those studies and he had all these conductor models which are uh, homogeneous, uh, infinite homogeneous and finite homogeneous and finite inhomogeneous. Holt was we made a large clinical study in that work as well. And then finally, multipole model, which has the dipole, quadrupole and octopole their terms and so many uh, variables. That kind of work was made by Brody, Ye, Martinek, Geselowitz and Plonsi and they used the trivial uh, uh, case for the conductor model, the infinite homogeneous or spherical homogeneous. So here is a collection of uh, various uh, clinical systems and, and theoretical works in electrocardiography and uh, shown what kind of source models and conductor models were used. What is good? What is good for clinical purpose? How do we get the best diagnosis? With what kind of model? Well, it's uh, logical to think that if the source model is very simple and the conductor model is actually not uh, considered, it is, it is trivial case, then apparently we do not get too accurate image of the heart. But if we have more and more complicated or detailed source model and use more and more uh, detailed conductor model, in this corner we should have a good electrocardiography lead system. Is it so? That's truth, but that's not the whole truth. I show you the whole, show you the whole truth. It's important that the source model which we have has a good correspondence with the real physiological anatomical heart. How are these? I've shown you already from the days of Augustus Woller, it has been known that the dipole model describes the heart surprisingly well. It is surprising how bad is the moving dipole. It is very non-physiological. It should be better, but it is not. Multiple dipole. This sounds very excellent when having separate source for each region of the cardiac muscle. It sounds excellent for diagnostic purposes. Multipole. That's a problem. Tell your cardiologist, clinical cardiologist colleague, describe him what is the fourth quadrupole component of the multipole model representing in the heart. I think he don't understand. I think um, that you are not either able to describe what it is. So this is mathematical issue that, do that doesn't have too much to do with real life. And that's not enough. What is the solvability of these models? I place two pluses here to the dipole because the dipole is easy to solve. It is the easiest to solve. Moving dipole is okay, it's possible to solve. What about multiple dipole? Was it 16 or how many uh, dipoles uh, uh, Sylvester had? What do you think about solving 16 different dipoles simultaneously from the source? 
I tell you it is not possible. How much it is possible to solve? The answer is three. You cannot in the inverse problem solve more than three. Three dipoles with single component. So one dipole with three components or three dipoles with single component. It is excellent in the forward problem, but in the inverse problem you cannot solve that. It should be discarded. How about multipole? That is possible. It is possible to solve the dipolar components and the quadrupolar components. And as I said, the heart is so far away from the surface of the thorax that the octapole components are not possible to solve, but quadrupole components you can get. So the problem is here. Multiple dipole represents beautifully the heart, the source of the heart, but you cannot solve it. You are able to solve the multipole, but it is very difficult to understand what it means in the real heart. So that is the dilemma. What is the solution? The solution in, in my understanding is that it is recorded as much information from the thorax surface as possible. How many electrodes are needed to, to do the recording? Not hundreds and hundreds because heart is so, so far away from the surface, but it is possible, I think, to use uh, uh, maybe 20, 30 electrodes and, and something like that. And then use the computer, computerized diagnostic system, which analyzes the signal. The computer don't think that uh, to which anatomical region of the heart this signal is connected. No, the computer does not uh, worry about that at all. It has a statistical problem on the basis of the millions and millions of ECG recordings. And it knows that when this kind of combination of signals is in the recording from the patient, it is most probable that the problem in the patient's heart is that and that and that. So that is the way to proceed. And that's something which I would like to do, to do but maybe it is not possible. The, the computerized programs are so complicated. But anyhow, this is the summary of source and conductor models in different clinical electrocardiographic lead systems and theoretical experiments. I have 15 minutes time to tell you about certain distortion factors in electrocardiography. I told you that the Frank system vector cardiographic signal will be undistorted, provided that the sources in the heart can be well described as a single fixed location dipole. The dipole is located in the position assumed by Frank. The thorax has the same shape as Frank's model and the thorax is homogeneous. But none of these assumptions are met clinically. The thorax uh, outer surface sometimes, but not always. So that's a problem. There is apparently a lot of distortion even in the Frank system. And as I told you, it is not dramatic because there is no absolute ECG which we want to record. It is always a relative issue. It is compared the recorded signal to the database of all health and sick, healthy and sick patients. I want to show you what is the in effect of inhomogeneity of thorax. Here are the projections of the lead vectors of 12 lead ECG system if the volume conductor is homogeneous and spherical or infinite homogeneous. That's how the lead vectors look like. This shows how the lead vectors look like in real case in the finite inhomogeneous torso. And you find that they are far away from those ideal ones which we think or actually cardiologist thinks when not knowing what is a real life. You see that uh, especially from this sagittal plane that the V2 and V3 just in front of the heart, the lead vectors are very long, they are very sensitive to the ECG signal. And anyhow, the lead vectors are far away from the ideal orientation and ideal length. So there is a lot of distortion coming from the inhomogeneities and the surface of the thorax. Brody effect. 
That's an important inhomogeneity or, or, or distortion. It was invented by Daniel Brody, who was a clinical cardiologist and also technically oriented. What is Brody effect? Assume that we have a homogeneous volume conductor and we have a homogeneous linear homogeneous lead field. If, we in, if that is, for instance, with the resistivity of the lung, lungs with 20 ohm meters, and then we introduce here a spherical heart model, uh, myocardium, and inside uh, the heart is the blood, with resistivity of 4 ohm meters for the myocardium, 1.6 for the blood, and those are the uh, radii. What happens to the lead field? That's what happens. This was calculated accurately with one of my colleagues in theoretical uh, electrotechnical science. And it is interesting that, of course, the lead field is strongly distorted in this way. But what is interesting is that in this homogeneous, if this is spherical model, in this homogeneous region inside here, the lead field in the inner part is linear and homogeneous. That's interesting. It is mathematically comes that it is linear homogeneous. But that doesn't matter because there's no sources in the heart. It's just mathematically interesting, but there is no source uh, to, to utilize this homogeneous lead field. The sources are in this myocardium region, and you find how it is distorted, this lead field. And here it is said, what is the Brody effect? This direction orientation is the radial direction in the coordinate system. And here is the linear uh, uh, direction of the lead field, which is the original direction. And actually, you see that in the myocardium, the lead field is bended so that it is in this direction, so much it deviates from the ori original horizontal direction. That takes place in this region of the heart. Here it is no distortion, and here it is quite linear as well. This bending of the lead field due to the higher conductivity of the cardiac muscle and still more high conductivity of the intracardiac blood is called Brody effect, which means that the radial forces in the cardiac source are amplified, stronger than what you would think they are. That is called the Brody effect. There is a nice work, very nice work, which is not usually referred. I found it once, once this. I will tell you this. I, I like this work very much, which experimentally uh, demonstrates the Brody effect. It was made with a dog experiment by Voikidis and colleagues, and uh, they studied the intracardiac blood, effect of intracardiac blood to the electrocardiogram. They used the dog as an experimental animal. They recorded with the Nelson lead system, doesn't matter which is the lead system, but Nelson lead system is good in clinical, uh, theoretical, scientific work. Here are the X, Y, and Z signals in Cartesian coordinates, and they just calculate this from there, the two angles, the, uh, the, the spherical coordinates, E and A, and the magnitude. This is the magnitude of the uh, uh, cardiac vector. So this is a P, QRS complex, and T, but it looks uh, different because it is just a magnitude. I told you earlier that in the cardiac activation, in the initial phase, the activation is oriented radially. And in the terminal phase here and here, it is oriented tangentially. So these three bumps of the QRS complex activity, ventricular activity, the first and the second bump are originating from the radial activation in the radial direction and the third bump from the activation in tangential direction. That's a, that's a key point for the experimental uh, basis. Let's see what is the effect of ventricular volume. This is not so clear. I don't fully agree with this, but I 
still it is logical, but I full don't fully agree. There are some technical problems here, but I, I show you. So these are, this is the recorded uh, ventricular activity QRS complex. And then the left ventricular diameter is changed just by uh, either sucking with a syringe some blood from the ventricle away so that the ventricle comes smaller. If taking the ventricular diameter 85% from the original, the signal changes like this and 70% of the original it changes like this. So you find that smaller ventricular volume decreases the body of body effect, the amplification of the radial forces and attenuation of tangential forces. So radial forces are decreased and tangential forces are increased. This is uh, in accordance with the body effect theory, but I don't like so much because when it is changed, the volume of the ventricle, the form of the heart is also changed. So it may also have effect. But the other study, this I fully agree. Effect of blood resistivity. It is changed the blood resistivity by changing the hematocrit of the blood. You remember that the, the resistivity is a strong function of the hematocrit of the blood. Higher blood resistivity, when having blood resistivity 150% from the normal, decreases the Brody effect because it becomes more homogeneous. So then the radial forces, which are amplified by the Brody effect, they will decrease, and that is true. And tangential forces, which are attenuated by the Brody effect, are increased beautifully in accordance with the theory. Then it is decreased the blood resistivity to 50% of the normal. The Brody effect increases and the radial forces further increase and tangential forces further decrease. So this is a beautiful demonstration of the effect, of the Brody effect. I like this work very much. We tried to do similar work a dog experiment with comparing the electrocardiogram and magnetocardiogram of the dog. Unfortunately, we did not succeed in that. It, it's, it's very difficult. We did not have uh, the medical uh, personnel was not sufficiently uh, experienced and, and qualified for that purpose. We, we did not succeed. Unfortunately, we made a lot of work. It had been nice to do similar work because, as you know, magnetocardiogram records only the tangential forces and electrocardiogram both radial and tangential. So it had been very nice to uh, repeat this work with such a demonstration with ECG and MCG. Unfortunately, very unfortunately, technically we did not succeed in the work. Then effect of respiration issue which is very practical clinical issue. I show you what is the effect of inspiration to inhaling air on QRS and STT parts of the ECG. The differences in heart vector due to inspiration are shown on the upper, uh, upper scale. I easily show from my computer screen, but from the upper sc uh, scale, uh, the magnitude and in elevation angle due to mid-respiration and full inspiration on QRS. So the difference of the magnitude of the QRS complex between mid-respiration and full inspiration is indicated here. And the difference in STT between mid-respiration and full inspiration is shown here. And here is the, the change in elevation. So what you see here is that there is a lot of effect to the ECG signal from the respiration. And why is that? Uh, because when the lungs are full of air, they are larger, their uh, impedance is, uh, resistivity is higher. And in addition to that, during the respiration, part of the lung is gliding out and over out and over the heart. So that has a lot of effect. Don't worry about the 
figures and numbers here, but you see that there is a lot of effect. And I show you another slide. Effect of inspiration on azimut and elevation of QRS and T. Here are the azimut angle. Uh, and uh, here is the effect uh, emitter respiration, the black and thin blue in full inspiration. And here are the differences which are generated due to the respiration. So you do not need to study what are the numbers. The purpose of these two slides is to emphasize that the ECG has to be recorded in mid-respiration, not <gasps> full inspiration, not full expiration, but in mid-respiration and very, very small thin respiration because it has a strong effect to the signal. Well, the effect of electrolocation, this I already told to you, so I do not repeat that. I think it's good time to stop here. Next time I tell you the basis of electrocardiographic diagnosis and some other issues. So thank you very much.